Safety standards for the US Navy's nuclear submarine training program are written in the blood of the submariners on Thresher. The sailors followed their standard operating procedures into a cascade of failures plummeting to the depths of the Atlantic. Thresher is the fastest and quietest submarine of its day, matching the smaller contemporary Skipjack class. It's created to find and destroy Soviet submarines. It has the most advanced weapon system, including launchers for the US Navy's newest anti-submarine missile, Subrock. It also has passive and active sonar that can detect vessels at unprecedented range. It's the first of a new class of nuclear-powered submarines, combining the attributes of an attack submarine and a specialized hunter-killer craft. The submarine has a cigar-shaped hull for efficient underwater performance based on the research submarine Albacore AGSS-569. In its bow is the massive BQQ-2 sonar, which is the most advanced sonar ever fitted to a submarine. The Thresher's four torpedo tubes sit behind the sonar two on each side angled out at 10 degrees from the center line. They can fire the latest anti-ship and anti-submarine torpedoes and at a later stage will be refitted to fire the ASROC anti-submarine rockets. ASROC is a combination rocket and torpedo. It's launched like a conventional torpedo, shoots to the surface, leaves the water on a ballistic trajectory and plunges back into the water at the target site where the nuclear warhead detonates. The submarine's S5W nuclear reactor plant gives it unlimited range. Its pressure hull, constructed of HY80 steel, enables it to dive to 400 meters. Following Navy tradition, the class of subs is originally named Thresher after the first boat. The contract to build Thresher is awarded to Portsmouth Naval Shipyard on the east coast of the US. Its keel is laid on the 28th of May 1958. It's launched on the 9th of July 1960 and is commissioned on the 3rd of August 1961 under Commander Dean Axeen. Thresher conducts lengthy sea trials in the Western Atlantic and Caribbean seas throughout 1960 and 1962. These tests allow a thorough evaluation of its many new and complex technological features and weapons. It takes part in nuclear submarine exercise New Sub-X 3-61 off the northeastern coast of the United States from the 18th to the 24th of September 1961. On the 18th of October 61, Thresher and diesel electric submarine Cavella head south on a three-week test and training cruise to San Juan, Puerto Rico, arriving on the 2nd of November. The nuclear reactor is shut down while in port. No shore power connection is available in San Juan, so the ship's backup diesel generator is used to carry the electrical loads while in port. After several hours, the backup generator breaks down and the electrical load is transferred to the ship's battery. Most of the battery power is needed to keep vital systems operating and to restart the reactor, so lighting and air conditioning are shut down. Without air conditioning, the temperature and humidity in the submarine rises to as high as 60 degrees Celsius after 10 hours, while the crew tries to repair the diesel generator. It becomes clear that the generator won't be fixed before the battery runs down, so the crew tries to restart the reactor. But the battery charge is already too low. The captain returns to the ship from a shore function just after the battery goes dead. The crew borrows a cable from another ship in the harbor and connects to Cavella, which provides enough power to allow Thresher to jumpstart her reactor. Thresher conducts further trials and fires test torpedoes before returning to Portsmouth on the 29th of November. The boat remains in port through the end of the year and spends the first two months of 1962 with its sonar and subrock systems under evaluation. In March, it takes part in New Subex 2-62, which is an exercise to improve the tactical capabilities of nuclear submarines and anti-submarine warfare training with Task Group Alpha. Off Charleston, South Carolina, Thresher undertakes operations supporting the development of the Subrock anti-submarine missile. It returns briefly to New England, then heads to Florida for more Subrock tests. In Port Canaveral, a tugboat accidentally hits the sub, damaging one of its ballast tanks. After being repaired at Gritton, Connecticut by the Electric Boat Company, Thresher heads south for more tests and trials off Key West, then returns north. 
It enters Portsmouth Shipyard on the 16th of July, 62, for a scheduled six-month maintenance program. One of the systems they need to check over carefully is the ballast system, which has been repaired after being hit by the tug. In order to service the system, the engineers install temporary strainers in the pipes to protect the valves. These strainers block contaminants from entering the pipework while the system is open. The work takes longer than expected and nearly nine months later, the ship is finally recertified and undocked on the 8th of April, 1963. On Tuesday, the 9th of April at 0800, Thresher, under the command of Lieutenant Commander John Wesley Harvey, departs from Kittery, Maine. It meets up with the submarine rescue ship Skylark at 1100 to begin its initial post-overhaul dive trials. Together, they sail to an area about 100 nautical miles east of Cape Cod, Massachusetts. During its two years of service, it's already been to its test depth about 40 times. In the afternoon, Thresher conducts an initial trim dive test, surfaces, then performs a second dive to 200 meters deep, which is half its test depth, where it remains submerged overnight. The next day, Wednesday the 10th of April at 06.30, Thresher re-establishes underwater communications with Skylark and sets about preparing for deep dive trials. At 0747, it starts to descend to the test depth of 400 meters. Five minutes later, it levels off at 220 meters and contacts the surface while the crew inspect the ship for leaks. No leaks are found and Thresher continues its dive. At 0825, it reaches 300 meters. Submarines typically rely on speed and deck angle or their angle of attack to ascend or descend. Much like a plane that alters the angle of its elevator to point the nose up or down, a submarine uses the angle of its diving planes and is propelled at an angle toward the surface or into a dive. If the sub is going fast and the diving planes jam when it's already at its test depth, it could send the ship below that depth in a matter of seconds. So submarines normally move slowly and cautiously at depth. The boat is descending in slow circles and announces to Skylark that it's turning to Corpen 090, which means it will turn to a heading of 90 degrees on the compass. Transmission quality from Thresher starts to deteriorate as they pass through a thermocline. Water in the ocean is not always the same temperature. Sometimes you have one warm layer of water floating on top of a cold layer of water. A thermocline is the point where they meet. It's as distinct as putting your arm down through the thermocline and your hand being in cold water while your body is in warmer water. The change in temperature also changes the speed of the radio waves and the turbulence between the two temperatures of water disrupts the signal. Just after nine, Thresher is cruising at only a few knots. Right here, there are two diverging interpretations of the data. One relies on information from testing and failures on other submarines, while the other relies on sound recordings in the ocean on that day. They both arrive at the same conclusion, but take different paths to get there. Based on the information from testing and experience on other submarines, the official report finds that at 0909, a pipe joint ruptures in the engine room. This same type of joint has failed previously on other ships using the same type of connection. Two pipes are joined using silver brazing, like soldering two copper pipes instead of a weld. Salt water from the reactor cooling pipe floods the engine room. The crew tries in vain to stop the leak while the engine room fills with a cloud of mist. On the other side of the engine room, water leaking from the broken pipe causes a short circuit in the electrics and the water pump providing cold water to cool the nuclear reactor shuts down. USS Abram Lincoln suffered pipes leaking from brazed pipe joints during trials. And USS Barbell suffers silver braze joint failure near test depth while on an exercise. The engine room in USS Barbell floods with almost 18 tons of water in the three minutes it takes to surface under power and with blown ballast tanks. In another scenario based on acoustic recordings, SOSIS or sound surveillance systems records two minutes of electrical instability and the electrical bus powering the main cooling pump fails at 0911, causing the cooling pump to trip. In the recordings, there's no sound of flooding water or a burst pipe. At that depth, the seawater spraying into the submarine would be under a huge amount of pressure. 
that type of spray creates a very specific sound wave which isn't present in the recordings. This SOSIS data was classified during the initial court inquiry and was only declassified in 2013, so wasn't entered into evidence or analyzed at the time of the incident in 1963. Commander Harvey orders full speed, full rise on the diving planes and to blow the main ballast to surface. Blowing the main ballast will fill the ballast tanks with air creating positive buoyancy. While the ship normally uses only the diving planes to angle its direction to the surface, the additional positive buoyancy from the ballast will ensure a rapid ascent. High pressure cylinders in Thresher hold compressed air. In order to replace water in the ballast tanks, the compressed air is released into the ballast tanks, forcing water out and replacing it with air. But when you open a valve like the ballast tank valve, air rapidly passes through the pipes. The air cools to the point that it causes condensation in the pipes to freeze. That's not normally a problem because as the high pressure air flows, it washes away any ice deposits. But now the temporary strainers installed in the system to protect the moving parts of the valves during maintenance block the flow of air to the point that the pipes freeze over. These strainers should have been removed before sea trials. In just a few seconds, the moisture freezes clogging the strainers and blocking the airflow, stopping the effort to blow ballast. Because the main cooling pump has shut down, the ship's nuclear reactor automatically shuts down to protect itself. When a nuclear reactor automatically shuts down in an emergency, it's called a scram. Thresher has no propulsion and no ballast control. Commander Harvey orders propulsion shifted to a battery powered backup system. The engine room crew try to fix the pump and then turn their attention to restarting the reactor, which will take at least seven minutes. The last time a nuclear submarine lost power in a controlled training environment, it took 20 minutes to restart. Jim Henry is a trainee reactor control officer on his first patrol, fresh from nuclear power school. He's standing in for Thresher's reactor control officer, Lieutenant Raymond McCool, who's on shore leave. Trainee Henry follows standard operating procedures and gives the order to isolate the steam system after the reactor scram, even though Thresher's around its maximum depth. The nuclear reactor heats water which turns to steam. Water expands 1600 times in volume when it turns to steam. The pressure that creates is channeled through a turbine which converts that energy into propulsion and electricity. Some of that steam is captured in a secondary chamber and released as needed. Reactor plant operating procedures don't allow for a rapid reactor restart following a scram, nor the ability to use steam remaining in the secondary system to propel the submarine to the surface. The system must cool down and then be restarted. After a scram, standard operating procedure is to isolate the main steam system, cutting off the flow of steam to the turbines providing propulsion and electricity. After it's closed, the large steam system isolation valves can't be reopened quickly. These procedures are for normal operating conditions. They're not intended to restrict emergency actions involving the safety of the ship. Had he been there, perhaps an experienced officer like Lieutenant McCool would have kept the valves open and used the excess steam in the secondary system to propel the submarine to the surface. At 0912, Skylark pages Thresher using the signal K. K is the signal used to tell another vessel you wish to communicate with them. Skylark is not aware of the conditions on board Thresher. They repeat the signal K twice. At 0913, Harvey reports their status via underwater telephone. The transmission is garbled, but some words are clear. We're experiencing minor difficulty, have positive up angle, trying to blow. Officers on Skylark hear the hiss of compressed air in the background. Skylark acknowledges with a quick Roger out and waits for further updates from the submarine. They send a follow-up message, no contacts in area. This message is sent to reassure Thresher that it can surface fast because there's nothing in the area they could possibly collide with. At 0915, Skylark asks Thresher to confirm its position relative to Skylark, but there's no response. Skylark's captain, Lieutenant Commander Hecker, now asks a more direct question. Are you in control? A minute later, Skylark picks up a garbled transmission from Thresher which is written in the ship's log as 900N. 
It might indicate the submarine's depth and course, or it might mean N as a negative answer to the question from Skylark, are you in control? A second transmission follows with the partially clear phrase, exceeding test depth. At 0918, Skylark detects a high energy, low frequency noise, characteristic of an implosion. The estimated depth is 730 meters, almost double Thresh's test depth. The implosion takes 0.1 seconds, too fast for the human nervous system to perceive. Skylark continues to send messages to Thresher, repeatedly calling for a radio check, a smoke bomb, or some other sign of the boat's condition. At 11.04, almost two hours since their last contact, Skylark tries to transmit a message to Comsubland, the commander of submarines for the Atlantic fleet. Can't communicate with Thresher since 0917. Have been calling every minute. Explosive signals every 10 minutes with no success. Last transmission received is garbled. Indicates Thresher is approaching test depth. Conducting expanding search. Radio problems mean that Comsub Lance doesn't receive and respond to this message until 1245. Lieutenant Commander Hecker initiates event submiss loss of a submarine procedures at 1121 and continues to repeatedly hail Thresher until 1700. At 18.30, the commander of the submarine force Atlantic sends word to Portsmouth Naval Shipyard to start notifying the crew's family members, starting with Commander Harvey's wife Irene, that Thresher is missing. Chief of Naval Operations Admiral George Anderson Jr. goes before the press corps at the Pentagon and announces that the submarine is lost with all hands. President John F. Kennedy orders all flags to be flown at half-staff from the 12th to the 15th of April in honor of the 129 lost submariners and shipyard personnel. From 1915 to 1963, the US Navy lost 16 submarines in non-combat accidents. Following this incident, the Navy implements a program called SubSafe, which is a more rigorous program of design review and safety inspections during construction. Since the implementation of SubSafe, only one submarine has been lost in similar circumstances. Air dryers are later retrofitted to the high-pressure air compressors in submarines to help eliminate ice buildup. Standard operating procedures are altered for fast recovery startup. This allows an immediate reactor restart and for steam from the secondary system to be used in limited quantities for several minutes following a scram. Having been lost at sea, Thresher is not decommissioned by the US Navy and remains on eternal patrol.